evening, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime Tonight. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high-profile and memorable true crime cases. Tonight, one of the biggest stories of the last 20 years. December 24th, 2002, Modesto, California. Ron Gransky calls 911 to report that his stepdaughter has disappeared. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just the least shock. Her name is Lacey Peterson. The case of this missing woman took the nation by storm with a massive search expanding to Southern California. Family and friends of Lacey would plead for her safe return. Whoever has her, please, please, please let her go. Bring her back. We to love us. her so much. We want her, we want her back. Please get her, let, her, let us have her back. But the focus and suspicions would soon turn to Lacey's husband, Scott Peterson. Scott sat down with police and explained the morning's events. We were watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart. Watch a little bit of that. He said when he returned home from a fishing trip at Berkeley Marina, his pregnant wife was gone. Authorities would conduct a search of the Peterson home. However, the public, and especially those closest to Lacey, questioned Scott's seemingly casual and strange behavior and felt he might be holding back. Did you murder your wife? No, no, no I did not. And I have absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. About a month after Lacey's disappearance, a woman named Amber Fry comes forward and says she unknowingly was having an affair with Scott. Little did he know that Fry had been working with police and recording their phone calls. On April 14th, 2003, the bodies of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son Connor were found washed up ashore in Richmond, California. Four days later, fearing he may flee the country, police arrest Scott Peterson near the Mexican border. He's sporting newly dyed hair, a beard, carrying $10,000 in cash, and a passport. Peterson would ultimately be charged with two counts of murder. The trial of Scott Peterson began on June 1st, 2004. Lasting five months and with over 170 witnesses taking the stand, the trial was a media frenzy that's still talked about to this day. In terms of just the trial itself, it was an absolute circus. Prosecutors allege that Peterson killed Lacey on or around Christmas Eve, transported her body in his boat, and tossed her into the San Francisco Bay. The bodies are found right in the bay where he was fishing that day. The state, though, couldn't identify how or where Lacey was killed, and they didn't even have a murder weapon. The jury, though, convicted Peterson of murdering Lacey and Connor, and he would be sentenced to death. <laughs> Yet after years of fighting through appeals, on August 24, 2020, the California Supreme Court reversed Peterson's death sentence for a possible retrial on the penalty. While Peterson's convictions remain intact, supporters say they have proof exonerating him. All of Scott's activities on December 24th are accounted for. In a case defined by circumstantial evidence, there are those who still ask, what exactly happened to Lacey? Let's start with the moment that sparked everything, the search, the theories, the whole case. Ron Gransky's 911 phone call. My son-in-law called. He's been playing golf this mm -hmm. morning mm -hmm. at 9.30. My daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just a leash shot. But Scott hadn't actually gone golfing that day. Lacey's sister and mother would testify that he told them he was planning on playing golf when, in reality, he went fishing. Also, when he went out from Berkeley Marina, he called his father and didn't tell him he was out on the water. In fact, his dad didn't even, didn't even know that Scott owned a boat. So it raises questions if he was lying about what he was up to. But Scott never concealed the fact that he went fishing. He was always consistent about that, whether he was talking to police or his family, just said it was too cold for golf and he switched plans. All right, maybe it was a misunderstanding, maybe it was misinformation. The problem for Scott Peterson was that the things he said or didn't say, and generally his overall behavior during the investigation, wound up hurting him. 
For instance, let's take a look at when Scott sat down with Detective Al Bronchini from, from Modesto PD the day after Lacey went missing. You guys had any problems, uh, marriage problems? Everything's good? Mm -hmm. You've been married four years? Yeah. Four or five. Yeah, I think. I guess it's five. I think you're married in 97. So you're married in 97? What concerns me the most is the fact that your dog came home with a leash on. That bothers me. Concerns me most is doing anything I can to further progress. I appreciate that, and I don't want you to hold. I don't want you to hold it against me. I mean, sometimes I hate asking. You got to do it. But I, I do. I really do have to do Aside it. Aside from him having trouble remembering when he got married, which is you know not that great, that kind of nonchalant, casual, almost aloof attitude when put when his per, his wife is missing didn't really go over so well with people. And some say that maybe he tried too hard to come off as innocent. Watch what happened when he sat down with Diane Sawyer. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no, uh, I did not. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And, and use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night and early in the morning. And during the day, all we can think about is the right resolution is to find her. What kind of marriage was it? God, I mean, the first word that comes to mind is, you know, glorious. I mean, we took care of each other very well. Um, she was amazing. She is amazing. So it's kind of weird that, you know, because Lacey hasn't been found yet, she hasn't been found dead, that it's weird that he uses the word was. But listen, I got a chance to sat down with Laura Uretzian, and she was on Scott Peterson's defense team, and I asked her all about this. You know what? People behave in all sorts of ways when they're when they've just lost a, someone close to them. There's no right or wrong way of behaving, and we are very quick, especially law enforcement, is very quick in judging people. If he had been crying a lot, they would say, oh, look, he's putting on a show. I've seen that argument, too. If you're too calm and you're in, a sh in shock, oh, see, he doesn't care. He's not crying I, I believe many of the jurors and everyone pretty much in the public was preconditioned to really convict him. I've always said it. Scott was convicted before he stepped foot in that courtroom for that trial. I'm joined now by long crime legal analyst Julie Rendleman and forensic death investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan. Julie, I want to start with you. I wonder if Scott didn't speak to police or the media and you just looked only at the evidence, would we have seen a different result for Peterson? Look, you know, one never knows what the result would be. We can only guess. I, you know, I say this and I've said this to you a million times. If you are the person that has lost your wife um, and you are potentially the subject of an investigation, let alone you're having an affair with another woman of which you're lying to that woman also, the best bet is to keep your mouth shut. Because the problem is the minute you speak, all that's going to happen is the prosecutors are going to tear apart Every single word you say, every move you make, every smile, every grimace, and they're going to use it to their advantage. There is nothing to be gained, and there was nothing to be gained for him speaking to anyone uh, in regards to this investigation. And we can't forget that at the end of the day, though, it seemed that Scott had an answer for everything. For example, he spoke to CBS 13, and he said that all the injuries on his hand they were from working on farms and machinery, including on the day that Lacey vanished. He claims that he reached into a toolbox, hit, cut himself, and that was maybe why it appeared that there was blood in the car, although that hasn't been positively identified. Now, Joseph, let me turn to you. Other than the possibility of his wife's hair found on a pair of pliers, how could Scott have killed his wife and left no physical evidence at the house the warehouse, the car, or the boat? Uh, hey, you know, Jesse, one of the 
one of the threads that's run through this whole case over the years has been what what methodology was employed in order to end her life? Well, it's very simple. It's it's almost like the perfect murder because a lot of people think that this is a smothering or a suffocation. Therefore, you're not going to have a bunch of bloodletting, if you will. It won't be a, a totally graphic scene where there's blood spattered all over the place and this sort of thing. There's not much to clean up. So in the grand scheme of things, uh, this was a very simplistic methodology. Think about think about just for a second. We're talking about a woman who is eight and a half months pregnant, Jesse. She doesn't have the ability uh, to defend herself. And that's a really good point. And that's the thing that kind of straggles people a little bit about this. I mean, how is it possible there's nothing there? And yet, while that was the prosecution's weakness in the end it really didn't hurt them but there's a lot we do have to get to and i'll tell you what when we come back we're going to get into scott's alibi the timeline and i know what you're waiting for the recordings with his mistress amber fry we'll be back Scott Peterson never did end up taking that polygraph, but he always maintained that he never murdered his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. Let's go back to his alibi for a second, because he says he went to a warehouse where he stored his boat, he checked his email, he assembled a machine, and then he went out to the marina. Now, the evidence actually supports that story. But Joseph, going back to you, if this is the timeline, it seems that he would have had to kill Lacey and then put her body in his truck while he was working in the warehouse in broad daylight for everyone to see. And that's a big criticism of the prosecution's case. Does this make sense to you? But yeah, it is, it is very difficult for the prosecution to overcome. I think probably what we're looking at also, Jesse, is the fact that, um, you know, Lacey's body was so badly decomposed from a forensic standpoint, it's very difficult for us to, you know, hang a definitive timeline. Uh, let's keep in mind all of her internal organs uh, were essentially missing. The only thing that was intact was the uterus. We've also got the head and uh, the limbs that have been, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, dismembered from the body. Uh, even the forensic pathologist could not make a determination as to when some of this trauma had occurred. So it leaves us out there kind of hanging uh, from a thread, as we always have been, because there's nothing definitive that we can actually hang our hat on. Right. And look, he goes out on his boat for about what he says is an hour and a half. And you remember, the bodies of Lacey and Connor are ultimately found near the area where he claims he went fishing. And I want you to listen to what he says he did the minute he came home. What did you do? Um, put my clothes in the washer, took out those rags, threw my clothes in there. Were you calling for Lacey or? Oh yeah, of course. But she wasn't home? No. Assume she's at her mom's. You're, you put your jeans, your blue t-shirt, anything else in there? I think that green polo was in there too, wasn't it? Did you did you use did you start the washer? Yeah. Did you put soap? Mm -hmm. but, okay, then what? Uh, grab some pizza from the fridge. Took the box out. Yeah. Put it on the counter like it was. Uh, lots of milk. Sure. Joseph, Peterson, Peterson said it was normal for someone who goes fishing to wash up. Nothing crazy there. But others said that is incredibly suspicious. Your take. Hey, listen, remember what we said earlier relative to cause of death when we talk about this idea of suffocation and smothering. There's no blood left behind. But let's keep this in mind. Uh, she, uh, Lacey, her body was missing the head and the limbs. This is messy business. Okay. Now, 
Maybe he didn't dismember her, but that would be a, a point where, uh, you know, this nastiness could have occurred relative to transfer of evidence onto clothing. So that has to be left out there to think about, you know, why would you purpose to wash your clothes? Maybe he's just a neat guy. But again, that question, uh, you know, for us has been asked, but I don't know if it's sufficiently been answered. And you just, again, look at his demeanor throughout that, says he's eating pizza, not a care in the world. And that was probably one of his biggest downfalls. But one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the state were the wiretap phone calls between Scott and his mistress, Amber Fry, who agreed to work with police and try to catch Scott on the phone. Now let's go back to New Year's Eve, because Scott was at a candlelight vigil for Lacey, but guess where he told Amber he was? Amber. Hey, happy New Year. Happy New Year. I wanted to call you. Thank you. Amber, you there? I'm here. Amber. I wish you could hear me. I'm on the, uh, I think, I think that you're there. I'm, uh, near the Eiffel Tower. New Year's celebration is unreal. The, the crowd is huge. The crowd's huge? Amber. Yes, I'm here. Amber, you're there. I can't hear you right now, but I'll call you on your New Year's. He eventually comes clean about the affair and says that he was lying about being a widower when he met her. You deserve so much better. There's no question you deserve so much better. Yeah, and I deserve to understand an explanation of why you told me you'd lost your wife and this was the first holidays you'd spend without her. That was December 9th you told me this, and now all of a sudden your wife's missing? Are you kidding yeah. me? Did you hear me? I did. I, 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 I got a Of course you couldn't tell me the story about your wife because it hadn't happened yet. And you were hoping to resolve in January that it would be resolved and you'd have a story to tell me. Do you think I had something to do with her disappearance? How would you believe that? Well, let's see. How can I believe that? How can I believe that? How could I believe anything for... I am not evil like that. I would hope not. I have, think, oh my God. Think, you've lied to me now? And he would even tell her that Lacey knew about the affair and was fine with it. Julie, what role did Amber play in Scott's guilt? So Amber, I think we would describe as the epicenter of this case. She comes forward, I think, a month after um, Lacey goes missing. And she basically quite frankly, makes this case explode. Uh, and we say that because she finally gave investigators the motive they needed um, for why Scott Peterson would not want his wife in the picture anymore. Um, and everyone knows, unfortunately, when a person goes missing and they're married, the first person you're going to look at is the husband. Husband. And, you know, they were already looking at him. I think Amber just gave them, you know, gave such a frenzy, even to the media, um, that everyone became even more and more focused. Um, and the word she got from him, the, the, being able to establish that he not only lied um, to everyone else, he lied to her about what was happening in regards to his wife being alive or dead, um, to me, goes straight into an issue of motive. Yep. Deception and motive. Those are the two big things here. Now, Scott Peterson's death penalty may have been overturned, mostly because of there were errors in jury selection, but his supporters say that his conviction should be tossed out, too. Now, Scott's sister-in-law went on Dr. Phil, and she describes some of the evidence that she says proves he's innocent. Newly found evidence is that the mailman came down the street between 1035 and 1050 the morning of December 24th. The mailman signed an affidavit that said if McKenzie was in the yard or in the house, he would bark at the mailman. And on December 24th, the mailman came by and McKenzie was not on the property. Basically what this means is that Lacey grabbed McKenzie and went on her walk. Hmm. Here's Scott Peterson's former attorney on his future and other suspects. You know, anything is possible. We've seen many cases overturned and it all depends on what the courts decide, but I'm keeping hopeful and I'm staying hopeful that it does happen. Again, I strongly believe, just like many other on the defense team and his family, that Scott didn't do this and he deserves another trial. Oh, that there was a burglary across the street uh, on the day of her disappearance. And there was, there was also some conversation between an inmate and his brother about accomplices involved in that burglary and have, having said that they saw Lacey and Lacey 
uh, basically tried to stop them. So there was talk, obviously, on the defense side that there's a great likelihood that they actually took, they're the ones who kidnapped Lacey because she caught him red-handed. Julia, you're listening to this idea of other evidence, and I know prosecutors have to decide if they want to retry Peterson on the death penalty, and the Supreme Court has said that his convictions stand as of now, but could all of this change one day? Could Peterson ever go free? Uh, you know, look, uh, I'm guessing no, but could he? Yes. I, I mean, we have not only just the issue regarding um, the, you know, the fact that the jurors um, were chosen, basically only those that agreed with the death penalty, which may have an impact on their ability to be fair with regards to the guilt or non-guilt of the individual. I think the second issue that came out also was the issue of publicity. Even though they moved the case at least once, in that second jurisdiction, there were so many jurors that still believed he was guilty even before they heard all the evidence. And then lastly, what we talk about right now in regards to other evidence, it is true that if, if the defense is able to establish there's other evidence that wasn't able to be shown, that would show that he is not guilty, that may open the door to a possibility of him getting a new trial. And Julie, real quick, following up on that, about 30 seconds, you heard um, his sister-in-law mention this idea of that there were people who weren't interviewed. That's a big deal, right? It, it, not necessarily. Uh, um, you know, not every single person has to be interviewed in order for um, it, a, a for there not to be a new trial. Right. The question is, if there's some, someone that wasn't interviewed that has real evidence that will change the course of this case. Right. And look, here's what we do know. While the trial of Scott Peterson may have ended years ago, the discussion has not. And with a possible new trial, this story is far from being over. Well, that's all we have for you tonight on Prime Crime Tonight. Tell you what, you should give us your comments on Scott Peterson or on any of the other cases we've covered. You can go on Twitter and Facebook with the hashtag Prime Crime Tonight. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, be safe.